Now, I believe we're gonna take some questions from the audience. I think those are gonna be collected. I think you write them down and pass them to your <coughs> left, and those will come to me. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, as someone that's researched for 15 years in the Middle East, uh, you, you cannot understand what it's like to go to Egypt now um, because before the revolution started in 2011, I would have to go to all these guys' offices individually to talk to them and hear their points of view. So the fact that we can get everybody on the same page, on the same stage, talking and interacting is really something that, uh, while it doesn't look like it's a major feat, is a tremendous feat when you uh, consider the days of uh, Hosni Mubarak and what that regime looked like. Um, but since uh, we're in America, there's many questions I would like to ask, but since we're in America, and um, I, I tend to have a, a bit of a pulse on what people think sometimes here. Um, I guess I'm gonna ask a sort of less Egyptianized question and a more provocative question. So there's this old argument that um, you know when it comes to democracy, the Arab world was somehow exceptional or it just couldn't stick. Maybe something culturally, maybe it's because of economic development, whatever. Um, and when the uprisings and revolutions started to happen around the region, many of us in the academy who've been arguing against this position for a long time breathed a sigh of relief and said, well, obviously people want democracy, so this culture and this area is not resistant. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that in, if, if one watches the news of Egypt in the United States, it looks very messy because we don't get to see the, 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 the small achievements that happen that you guys see. We see people in the streets fighting. We see tear gas, and um, apparently we keep shipping tear gas over there, which is very nice of us. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, but um, so, so what this is doing, though, right, is when you get people who are very busy in their lives and live in the United States and they see the news, their first reaction is like, wait a second. Was this worth it? Like, look at this mess that's created, right? Maybe we should support stability, which is always code for authoritarianism in the Middle East. So um, how would you respond to uh, that question being posed by an American audience? Is democracy something that just doesn't work in your country, or? I'm sure we're gonna all agree on this, so well, go right. ahead, please. <laughs> okay. That is a cross-ideological question. Yes. <laughs> and uh, to put I it down the middle right, of the Right, I believe yeah. one, can, one can, can offer a cross-ideological answer as well. Um, let, me, let me start by, by saying that I believe public, um, uh, public opinion uh, trends in Egypt um, do document uh, uh, that process of disenchantment. I will continue to document that Egyptians are eager to have dignity, social justice, and freedom in their country. So while people are becoming increasingly disenchanted with what politics and politicians are offering, they continue to uphold the major demands which they put forward in January 2011. I believe the same can be said about Tunisia to move beyond Egypt uh, to an extent. Now, the trouble is not uh, in what we are going through because those processes are bound to be messy. Democratic transition is never, is never a neat and a well-defined process. And we just have to go back to what was unfolding in the 1990s in Eastern European countries or later in the decade of the 1990s in the Balkans or in Latin American countries or in different African Asian countries to realize that democratic transitions are always messy and they entail a great deal of power struggles and they entail a great deal of polarized environments and they entail a great, a great deal of failure in building consensus. In some places, it took two parliamentary cycles. In fact, if you go back to Eastern European countries and revisit what happened, majority parties, parties, I'm not saying it uh, to tease Dr. Amr Darag or uh, Sami, but in reality, in many Eastern European countries, parties which were elected in majority positions in parliaments were voted out later on after two mm -hmm. parliamentary cycles and never made it again. That's true. <laughs> That's wishful thinking. <laughs> That's right, right, right. So I'm stressing never made it again. So, but, so, so those processes are messy. And sometimes violence, violence, uh, violence happens as well. 
Now, so let's please put Egypt, Tunisia. Uh, Libya is a bit of an exceptional case, rightly, as you mentioned, Josh, because of foreign interference. But let's put the two cases where we did have or continue to have ongoing revolutions and democratic transitions, let's put them in context of comparable <coughs> citizens' democratic revolutions in Eastern European countries and elsewhere. You will get a picture as much as it's painful, as much as it's tiring. We are not odd. We, do, we are not, an, once again, an exceptional case. And so the question of compatibility between our societies and democracy is, to my mind, not a question and should be pushed aside. Now, we can make it, and probably we are, and hopefully we will, we will make it. Secondly, let me say that what one of, and here I'm, 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 I'll once again become Egypt specific. <laughs> we are, we are, we are in a country where we have had a long history of stable state institutions. State institutions have been stable, but have been autocratic in terms of how they approached the electorate, how they approached and reached out to citizens, uh, networks of patrimonialism, networks of um, uh, loyalty uh, going um, in, 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 a, in, um, in, in a straight and um, one-sided direction, all the way to the president. The president ruled Egypt uh, since uh, 1952 as an uncontested center of power, center of gravity. So we have had, yes, stable state institutions. Mm -hmm. And to an extent, that stability was promoted by external actors in, in, different, uh, in different phases. However, that was an autocratic stability. And autocratic stability, at the end of the day, never delivers to people's right. needs and demands. So yes, it's messy. Yes, it's uh, a violent environment to an extent. Yes, it's not that um, easy to convince Egyptians to stick to the democratic process. We have that disenchantment. But once again, that is the only way we have to go forward. We've got to democratize. We've got to build a system which respects rule of law and rotation of power, and it will take time, just as it took time everywhere else. I think that sounds great. And since that was a cross-ideological question, uh, I'm going to ask an, another one, but I'm going to direct it to um, Dr. El-Shabragi. Uh, again, watching the news on the TV, reading the New York Times, these sorts of things, we read about women being repressed, women not being represented. Um, as an Egyptian woman, um, what would you like to tell an American audience about this process of, of women's participation and inclusion in the country? Um, first, before I get into that, I would like to quickly uh, say, um, when it comes to your first question, Josh, yes. about the um, uh, w whether it's worth it and the messy uh, things people see on, uh, on TV around the world, I would actually refer to uh, Professor Gordon Wood who actually talked to us um, yesterday uh, a lot about the American Revolution and how messy it was for years before things uh, settled. So um, I think that this is um, a, an important uh, um, thing to put in perspective. And the second thing is um, Egypt has always had, by the way, they were the, before the revolution, people were uh, saying um, around the world, especially Western academics, were saying, you know, um, Egyptians never revolt, which is not true. The first revolt in Egypt's history was during the pharaohs uh, when th those who were building the pyramids were actually protesting their low wages. And uh, so the first protest in our history was even against a pharaoh. So um, that's, um, that's uh, when it comes to um, women, I think um, that women in this room will, um, will know exactly what I'm talking about when I say that um, you know, um, preparing for the revolution or the, 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 during the struggle um, until the revolution, uh, women were, were not just part, <coughs> were not just part of, were not just partners. Women were actually sometimes leaders, sometimes instigators, sometimes actually uh, protectors in those, uh, uh, in the national movement of Egypt. During the revolution, or the 18 days of toppling Mubarak, um, women were all over the place, actually um, 
I don't know if you can, uh, if you have already seen um, the, the video that came out one week before the revolution by one of our uh, young um, uh, uh, women who actually was um, saying to men, she was actually playing on the, uh, the, the patriarchal um, ideas and telling men, if you really um, think that we women have to be protected, come down to Tahrir Square to protect us because I'm going and you need to protect me. <laughs> and so this is what I mean by instigators as well. But it's the same sad story all around the world. Once it comes to now this is over, once it comes now to sharing uh, uh, power, women are immediately marginalized. And this is the story of women in the United States, it's the story of women in Egypt, and it's the story all around the world. And the struggle for women's rights is a, um, is a, is a long struggle. I, um, I, I cannot um, empathize enough with women here in the United States with the fair uh, pay um, and equal pay uh, resolution that has never passed. And um, for me, I was in the Constitutional Assembly that wrote the Constitution, and I worked very hard and fought very hard for women's rights, and I was defeated. And I must tell you that I was defeated by, by the liberals and by all other trends. And at that point, I told all my colleagues then, I told them when it comes to women's rights, there is no such thing as Muslim brothers and liberals. All of you guys are men. <laughs> and this is actually what happened during uh, the Constitutional Assembly on Women Issues, and I'm going to write my testimony on what happened on this issue because people, women in Egypt and women around the world need to, to know what happened. Um, and I was doing this, um, I, I hate saying I, but I was, it was only me as a, as, a, as a woman in the leadership position. I was Deputy Secretary General. Dr. Amr was uh, my boss. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you can imagine it's a, it's a, it's a uh, 19 uh, uh, member um, leadership mm -hmm. in which uh, I was the only woman and um, they were sometimes shutting me off and I never allowed them to shut me off. <laughs> and <laughs> so, uh, the, in other words, the struggle for women's rights is, um, uh, is an ongoing struggle in Egypt just as everywhere else, but to me the problem for Egypt is that we have women organizations but we do not have a women movement. And that's the problem. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, our, our sort of leading vote getter in terms of the questions that were posed uh, really have to do with the role of the Muslim Brotherhood, Muslims, Islam generally, and uh, how that interacts with the Coptic cross Christian minority. General numbers put it at 90% uh, Muslims in Egypt and 10% Christians, although there is some debate about that. And so the questions generally say, religious institutions are inherently non-democratic. How can democracy flourish in a Muslim country or any religious state? Um, uh, what about Christian rights under the Muslim Brotherhood? What are their rights? Please comment on the tr treatment of Coptic Christians in Cairo. How about the Muslim Brotherhood change its name to something more inclusive? That would be a start. So, <laughs> Dr. Dorad. <laughs> Excellent. How about the Muslim <laughs> Christian brother? <laughs> that would be <laughs> okay. Uh, Change your name. Uh, uh, okay. Um, Generally speaking, I think it's 
how does Islam work with democracy? How does the Muslim Brotherhood work with democracy? Yes. And, of course, the role of the minorities. Uh, we have a little bit of a problem because in, in many countries that, uh, that governance was made um, uh, in the name of Islam, the real Islamic values were not really applied the way they should have been. And uh, this gave the impression to a lot of people in the world that there is a contradiction be between the basic values of Islam and the, 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 the values of the modernity and democracy. And in, 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 in our opinion, in the Muslim Brotherhood, and definitely in the party, is that actually there is very little, very little differences between the basic values of Islam uh, and the basic values of modernity and democracy. When it comes to people's governance, for example, uh, the, the, the choice of the ruler of the people, in both disciplines, stems from the people, not by an authority of God or anybody else. As a matter of fact, th as a matter of fact this is by far more superior than uh, a more or less secular regime that used to be before the Egyptian revolution that was based on dictatorship. Which one is, is closer to the standards of modern uh, uh, values? Uh, when it comes to, uh, the reference just refers to minorities and, and stuff like that. Yes, uh, in numbers, Christians in Egypt constitute uh, uh, about 10% of the population, uh, plus or minus. But nevertheless, as citizens, they are not minority. When it comes to religion, yes, there are, you know, there are fewer uh, uh, Christians than fewer than, than Muslims. But in, in terms of citizenship, you sh we should not, we do not really acknowledge any difference between Muslims and Christians and Jews and anybody else when it comes to practicing citizenship. And this is reflected, for example, in the new constitution. Mm -hmm. There is no reference whatsoever to the word minority in the constitution. Or we, we, we talk about citizens, rights of citizens. You cannot discriminate between citizens or any basis, whether religion, whether gender, mm -hmm. whatever, okay? So in terms, in, in, what we hope that happens as Freedom and Justice Party, we are basing our, we are basing our model based on the basics of, of Islam. We hope to, brief, to pro prove to the whole world that there is no real contradiction with, uh, 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 between the two systems. As a matter of fact, I don't want to say that, uh, that Islamic values are uh, consistent with modern values. What I want to say is that the modern values are consistent with the Islamic values because actually the, the Islamic values pre preceded the, and they came long time before that. The problem is that they, they in, in, in the modern time, in the modern history, they were not applied in the right context. And we, we hope to develop the systems, the disciplines, the modern institutions that will prove to the whole world that this is a viable system that can really make a difference and can achieve progress and can do the best thing for the citizens, whether Muslims, Christians, men, women, whatever. Dr. Durag, that's very good. Uh, Dr. Durag. <laughs> Uh, Freedom and Justice Party, you can never change that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, military officers putting on suits. Yeah. Um, no, uh, so uh, that's a joke from yesterday. Um, uh, I'd like to push back just a little bit. Um, just recently in um, Egypt, there's become a small movement that has emerged in the newspapers saying that no, actually the state does have a problem with uh, Muslims and Christians because on the back of the national ID card, yeah. which is similar to a sort of uh, driver's license in this country, uh, it identifies you if you're Muslim or Christian. So would something, would the Freedom and Justice Party support having that removed, like some people are calling for? There, there is a reason for that, and that was not developed by the Freedom and Justice Party. I understand. A, and, and the reason for that is that there are legislations that dif differentiate in, in terms of marriage, for example. You cannot have a, a, a Christian uh, a man marrying a, a, a Muslim woman, okay? So, you know, things like that, things like inheritance and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So this is related to some matters related to the personal affairs and uh, uh, marriage laws and things like that. But when it comes to citizenship in terms of, of uh, 
uh, uh, joining any job or, 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 or practicing politics or being in any position, this does not prevent anybody. I'm not saying that in, in reality this does not happen. Yes, there are problems. Some people are not doing the right thing. Right. What I'm saying is that we as a party, at least, we are proponing and we are going to propone and we are going to push for full rights of every citizen in Egypt. Great, thanks. Um, uh, now that uh, I'm going to push back, uh, I have two more questions. One I'm going to uh, direct to Dr. Hamzali. Uh, there was a question about the boycott, the opposition boycott. And specifically it said, uh, can you please speak on the opposition strategy of boycotting the upcoming elections? Is this a good idea? Is this a good idea for democracy? And please be brief because I got a question for Dr. Sammy after that. <laughs> right, okay. Thank you, Dr. okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Sammy. Uh, Josh, allow me to, to uh, go one, one step backward Please. to address the question of equal citizenship rights. Mm -hmm. Because in, 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 in uh, transparency and I believe in uh, objectivity, there are different issues which need to be tackled. I'm not going to take you into uh, details of different discussions which continue to be um, uh, going on in Egypt with regard to whether the existing uh, constitution, the constitution of 2012, uh, does offer equal citizenship rights and does uh, organize the relationship between religion and the state in a way which is conducive to uh, a modern state uh, or not. We have ongoing discussions. I believe that there are some articles in the Constitution of 2012 which are problematic uh, with regard to uh, putting uh, the religious establishment, the official religious establishment, the Islamic religious establishment uh, represented um, uh, by Al-Azhar institution uh, to an extent over the legislative branch of government when it comes to legislating uh, in relation to issues pertaining to Islamic laws. And there are other issues which um, are quite problematic with regard to equal citizenship rights. I believe that is a discussion which continues to be fought in Egypt and it should not be undermined in, in, in what we are presenting to you outside of Egypt. Secondly, there are issues which I would identify as discriminatory practices and those discriminatory practices, and I believe Dr. Amdarag will not disagree, need to be tackled at two levels at least. At the legal level, we have some laws which need to be fixed. We need a unified law for building places of worship, uh, to grant uh, equal uh, religious freedoms uh, for all Egyptians. We need to look at how to issue an anti-discrimination law, penalizing discriminatory measures, and we have to fix the uh, environment which has been conducive to discrimination for a long time. And finally, questions of sectarian violence needs to be tackled by taking the principle of rule of law yes, seriously. Sure. So I'm not, I'm not saying, and, and, and Josh, you, you, you asked yes. a question about the ID. Yes. Uh, Egyptian IDs and the reference uh, in Egyptian IDs, personal IDs to uh, religious affiliation. In fact, in the People's Assembly, 2011-2012, uh, and we had six months of operations, then we were dissolved by a court ruling, I did introduce uh, an amendment to take off uh, the reference to religious affiliation from uh, personal IDs in Egypt, and of course it was voted down. It was voted down by the majority of freedom and justice and different right-wing, religious right-wing parties. It remains an issue because even even symbolically, it matters. I mean, uh, for, for marriage issues, you need the birth certificate, and in your birth certificate, people are, are, are defined in terms of their religious affiliation. We do not have to have it on our IDs if we are going to push forward uh, more of an equal citizenship rights-based environment and more of a citizenship-based environment in which really what matters is whether we are citizens or not. On, on the question of boycott, uh, boycott is never, is in, in general, is never a good strategy. Political parties are established to compete, are established to contest elections, to participate in elections, and should be eager to govern. And politicians, by nature, uh, do not like to be sidelined, do not like to uh, sit in front of TV uh, sets and watch uh, political dynamics as they unfold. They would like to be part of it. So boycott is never a good strategy. And there are conditions, uh, however, there are conditions uh, under which boycott might be um, a viable strategy for some time. Uh, and one of those conditions is related to whether the rules of the game are democratic or undemocratic. Once again, I do not like to take you into the details of Egyptian questions, but 
but we have real arguments about whether the constitutional and legal uh, conditions of the political game are just democratic or lack democracy and lack the just nature. When opposition parties, as of now, the National Salvation Front, which I belong to, put forward boycotting the parliamentary elections as a strategy, it's meant as a conditional and conditioned <laughs> strategy. We are hoping that the rule, rules of the game will be just and uh, will be fixed before we reach the parliamentary elections and therefore we can participate. But once again, participation at any cost, uh, which is here in the US, maybe what is always being uh, pushed forward by the administration and by uh, political Washington in general is, 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 is not simply a viable uh, alternative if you do not have just uh, rules for the political game. Let me remind Egypt experts here and, 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 and the panel of the elections of 2010 in which boycott was maybe one of the most viable strategies ever put forward by the Egyptian opposition and did pave the way for the revolution of 2011. So it depends on what kind of composition of rules and arrangements we are looking at. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. El Sharbagi had an intervention she wanted to make, so the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Um, I would like to say a couple of things. The first one is definitely um, just as uh, uh, the right, the equal rights of women um, is, a, is an ongoing struggle. It's also the same for um, equal uh, citizenship for uh, my fellow Christian Egyptians. And this is a matter that we have to all face and uh, we, we should not be in a, uh, in a uh, state of denial. Um, the, the, the second thing I wanted to talk <coughs> about is uh, the question that um, Josh uh, have just read from here about the institutions, uh, that the religious institutions and how um, undemocratic they are. Um, and um, I would like to, to say to all of you, um, guess what? The religious institution in Egypt, which is Al-Azhar, that is, um, the Al-Azhar University and the Al-Azhar as the establishment, the religious institution of Egypt. Guess what? Liberals in Egypt every now and then run to Al-Azhar and ask them to come and play politics, to come and solve their political problems for them. Well, when this happened first before um, the writing of the Constitution, I was strongly against it. And I wrote two articles strongly against inviting Al-Azhar to be part of um, the uh, Egyptian political work. And I was, of course, I was, I was bashed, I was attacked by all sides. Now, Al-Azhar was invited to write a political document for Egypt, then was invited to write a political document on women, then was invited, um, lately, Al-Azhar invited um, everybody to go and have a dialogue and everybody went. And during uh, or inside the uh, Constitutional Assembly, I was strongly against this Al-Azhar um, article, but you know what? You have to, um, watch out for what you are doing. If you are actually going to Al-Azhar and asking the, the religious institution to write you political documents, do not, do not weep when Al-Azhar says, I need to be on board as the article of the Constitution was. So, uh, in other words, uh, things sometimes do not sound like what they uh, sound because there are, um, I, was, uh, I was involved during uh, the writing of this article, I was strongly against it and in the end it passed because both sides wanted it. So the, the, um, this is uh, um, the, the, the first uh, point that I wanted to make and then I would add, um, uh, guess what again? Um, Al Baradi, who is a liberal and he's a very famous um, uh, internationally, has just um, uh, called for um, any dialogue to be under the um, or under the auspices of both Al Azhar and the Egyptian Church. And 
you know, you, you need to watch what you're looking for because if you're asking for that, do not come and complain when Al-Azhar takes a position on politics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I had a very easy question for uh, Dr. Atea, which was uh, essentially, um, in five years, what does the future of Egypt look like politically? Mm -hmm. and economically? Very easy. Very easy. Uh, I think he also <laughs> wanted to make a brief comment, and so he will have the last word. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I have to comment uh, on several uh, questions you asked it about uh, Muslim Brotherhood and how can they become uh, or practice democracy. <coughs> Actually, Muslim Brotherhood was the only uh, institution practicing democracy all over the uh, 60 uh, years of uh, Mubarak and uh, Nasser and uh, Sadat. Why? Because all the institution is democ uh, democratically elected. The uh, supreme uh, guidance, uh, the, the guidance office, the offices working in uh, municipalities, uh, the Shura Council, with, you know, uh, which is our parliament, everywhere, every, every district, we have elections. I joined uh, Muslim Brotherhood in 1996, and since then, I was practicing democracy. And I didn't practice democracy in Egypt. Uh, only in, yet, uh, yani, I practiced it only in Muslim Brotherhood. Yes. Guess what? Two. <laughs> Muslims practiced democracy before the world knew what is democracy. We had Shura 1400 years ago, and Shura is democracy. It's a consultation. Yeah. Yes. We, we practiced elections 1,400 years ago. So Islam and Islamic uh, groups and, or uh, Islamic uh, uh, parties like freedom and justice is not with a conflict with democracy. I practice democracy. I practice elections in freedom and justice party in this one and a half year more than four times which never happened in any other party. Four times in one, in, in 18 months, elections. So we are not only theoretically with democracy, no, we are practicing democracy. Fantastic. Okay. Dr. This is, oh, go ahead. Okay, this is about <laughs> democracy, about the question about Christians and the rights of Christians in Egypt. Uh, actually, uh, Egypt has Christians and Muslims 1,400 years ago, and we, we never heard that there is a problem between uh, Muslim and Christian. We never heard that uh, my neighbor is Christian or my neighbor is, is Muslim. Uh, Dr. Hassan Ariane, which is who is the uh, vice president of our uh, uh, party, of course, he's Muslim. Uh, some of his cousins are Christians because his grandfather was uh, Muslim and uh, was Christian and converted. So this is normal in Egypt. Uh, the former regime tried to make it a problem. Uh, Christians uh, did face a problem. Yes, Christians did and still having or facing problems in Egypt, also Muslims. So the problems wasn't only uh, going to uh, uh, Christians because of they are Christians? No. We all face the same problems. We all face the same discrimination. We all were slaves in our country. And this is why we, we went to this revolution, to free ourselves, to free the country. So what will happen after five years, as you asked Josh? I am very, very optimistic. Uh, I am not optimistic like Dr. Amr. I am super optimistic. Even, even more optimistic. <laughs> yes, than even Fantastic. more optimistic. I think Egypt. I hope Egypt. I work for this, and I am sure all the, all our colleagues will work together for this. Uh, 
Egypt in five years will take the leadership of the region. E uh, Egypt in five years uh, will have uh, restructures and strong economy, inshallah. Uh, not the one of, of the best yet, but will go to the uh, <coughs> ranked uh, economies in the world, inshallah, in less than 10 years. Uh, democracy will be well established. Uh, I hope uh, we will be in a very, very better shape in five years, inshallah. Thank you very much. Dr. Hamzari wants the last word. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 it's, it's simply I'm, uh, I plead the A for um, uh, being, being um, uh, differentiated when we address how liberal politicians and party uh, stand vis-a-vis -vis two major issues in Egyptian mm -hmm. politics. One, the role of the army, and two, the role of religious establishment. Yes. There are some liberal voices so-called liberal voices in Egypt, which call on the army to interfere. And yes. you know that I have always been, and in a very upfront manner, against it. And it's completely undemocratically spirited. And it goes against respecting the will of the population and taking democratic procedures and mechanisms seriously. Even evoking the image of the army as the sa last savior, or the army will fix it, is wrong and is undemocratically spirited. Secondly, with regard to the religious establishment, I believe Al-Azhar and the church <coughs> have a role to play in social issues. I went the last time to Al-Azhar in a debate about renouncing violence. And in front of the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, the head of Al-Azhar establishment, I said that Al-Azhar should not interfere in politics in any manner. And it was on the record. And I said it. And I stick by that opinion that it's definitely wrong to call on Al-Azhar or to call on religious institutions to interfere. But it was not it was not liberal parties or leftist parties which wrote and enshrined in the Constitution Article 4, which stipulates that the legislative branch of government consults with Al-Azhar when it legislates in relation to religious matters and now in reality but why who, would the, but who, sorry I'm no, for, let me let me finish my sentence why no, would let me the renouncing of let violence be sentence. in al-azhar well let me finish my sentence not a single mp with Article 4, in reality, when we have a House of Representatives, and since it's mandated and stipulated to consult with Al-Azhar, not a single MP can stand up and say, I'm against Al-Azhar's consultation. We are putting MPs in a very dangerous and tough situation to legislate of for course. the country. Of and course. therefore, Article 4, which came about by the Constituent Assembly, which drafted the Constitution, which I boycotted, Ziad Baha Eddin boycotted, and other liberal politicians and liberal leftist politicians okay. boycotted, That's it came sense. into being. Finally, mm -hmm. why, why does renouncing violence have to be Al-Azhar? be in Al-Azhar can be anywhere else. But when it comes to legislative or executive business, Al-Azhar, as well as the church, as well as the army, have to be pushed aside. They have nothing to Absolutely. do with the civilian management of politics, Absolutely. unless unless we would like to, once again, reinvent the wheel and push Egypt back to unpleasant times. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> because uh, because I, I, I simply so, do not understand okay, why okay. people okay. would go to Al-Azhar to renounce violence. This is a political issue okay. and should be tackled by politicians no. uh, without Al-Azhar. And I have been, as I said, very strongly against this Al-Azhar article. But once one more point. Now, uh, people in the liberal left the liberal left parties are actually calling on Al-Azhar to say its word on the Sukuk. Yes. The bonds. Which is no, actually the, bonds. the implementation. Not, the implementation of Article 4. Only some. Yes, of, not course, generalized. of course. Say some, some of course. liberal politicians, I do not belong to them. And okay. it's wrong. Yeah, you don't, but. <laughs> so well, unfortunately, large. unfortunately, uh, uh, we're going to dinner where I think it's, the conversation is going to continue. Uh, unfortunately, you can't come with us. Uh, thank you for spending an extra nine minutes with us. And uh, thank you all for coming. Sorry.